No, I wouldn't say that's a resurrection. Why would so you? when when Paul saw Jesus on the road to Damascus, mm -hmm. I mean, you agree that he was knocked blind, right? Yeah. And a blind man saw Jesus. Well, I would say that uh, they all saw the bright light. It doesn't say that Paul was blinded on the spot. It said that after the sight went away, then he didn't see anything. He was blind, but it doesn't say he was blind immediately. So a physical body had this bright light that blinded people. So at that point in time, when this physical body of Jesus was somehow levitating up in the real clouds, you know, above the real ground, in real space-time, uh, was that the first real body that he had, or was that this changed body that he had? Okay. Which body was that, after me, two or three years? I, I would say the changed body. But let, me, but let me ask you this, are you granting me acts? Because um, if you're granting me acts, then we can really settle this thing with bodily resurrection very easily about Paul. Well, in Acts, we find contradictory accounts of the... Re of Not the, at all. Uh, I don't find yes, that Yes, we all. do. We find that in one case, in Acts 9-7, the, uh, the men that were with him heard a voice. But later, in Acts 22-9, the men that were with Paul heard not the voice. It's a direct contradiction in the Bible. No, it isn't. Like, yes, it is. I have to agree with that. Let me ask you that. You've said this a couple of times. I'm just curious. Have you ever taken a course in Greek? Yes, I have. I've translated much of the New Testament from the Greek language. How, ma how many courses college courses have you taken in Greek? Two years of college Greek. Two years of college Greek. Okay, of so that gets, you, Greek. that gets you through, of Koine Greek, of course. Okay, that gets you through beginners and intermediate Greek. Uh, maybe a course of exegesis. I can appreciate that. Okay, uh, and I've had five years of Greek and I've studied Greek now for 20 years. Um, and, you know, I, I can say these things you're saying, Dan, they, they just don't add up with the Greek. Well, then we, explain it. Okay, Tell well, us first why. of all, in Acts chapter 9, verse 7, where it says he... Um, you know, they heard the voice. Um, and in Acts 22, 9, when it says they didn't hear it, the Greek word for hear is a kuo. And it can mean both hear and to understand. So, you know, I think the translators have it correctly. And, and the majority, if you look at almost any translation of the New Testament, it will say in one, they heard the voice, but they didn't understand what it was saying. And what was the word in Acts 22, 9? Acts 22, 9? Okay. It's akuo, it's the same word. Exactly, right. In Acts 9, 7, uh, uh, they, uh, it was the participle. They heard the voice. But in Acts 22, 9, uk ikusan, they did not hear the same word. They didn't verb. understand. It could mean they didn't understand the voice. Well, then in both cases, it could be understand. It's a contradiction either way you not, go. Not at all. Because, see, for first century people reading Greek, that's not going to be a problem at all. Let's suppose the electricity went out in here right now, and no one could see us, you know, except maybe some people here. Um, and then some, pe and the sound system was out, but we just kept talking. We kept going. And uh, the next day, someone who was at the back, they're talking about this debate, and they said, "Yeah, the lights went out." And uh, yep, they kept talking. I heard them. I heard them talk. Um, but the, but then later on, they say, "Man, I couldn't hear a word they said." Well, I think we could understand. There's no contradiction there. They understand what we're saying. We, they, that the word "here" was used on both occasions. So I don't see anything contradiction here and even Daniel Wallace who's a prominent Greek grammarian and in his book Greek uh, Greek grammar beyond the basics he talks about this very passage and says given the field of use of akuo and phone and the fact that in chapter 9 it's akuo plus the genitive and in chapter 22 it's akuo plus the direct plus the accusative it's the dative yeah. it's accusative it's the... um, he said well we can look you said 22 9 well, it doesn't matter. There are two different cases. I agree with that. No, but I've got it, it right also... here. It's, it's the accusative. Uh, it's phonane. Tain phonane. Okay. So um, given that, he says, given the fact that it's taken on a different uh, um, uh, ending there, he says that certainly harmonizes. No, that's totally wrong. I've All studied right, now, this. So you're saying you have two years Greek experience. Yes. You're I'm... right. And Daniel Wallace, who's a very prominent and respected Greek grammarian, is wrong. He's wrong. And I can show you exactly why he's wrong. All through the New Testament, mm -hmm. there's a, a, a loose interchange of case flexibility. I will show you other cases where those exact words are used to signify opposite words, but where the case changes, it would produce a different contradiction. The case flexibility there does not change the meaning of the word, in spite of what some of these people show. It, in fact, I wrote a good article on that, Did Paul's Men Hear a Voice, going yeah, into I, great I read detail. It, and I, I found it problematic for the reasons I've explained. Well, well then look up those verses that I, that I explained, and look at the fact that those cases differ. Uh, and, and, and what's, of course what's they the differ, problem? and that's precisely why Wallace says that there's no but, problem here but with they the differ, they differ in places where Matthew tells a story where uh, they heard the voice of the king, 
And then Luke tells the same story. They heard the voice of the king. The same story, the same king, and yet different cases. Are you telling me that there's different meanings in both retelling of the same story? Of course not. They were flexible enough to change those cases from the accusative to the dative and then uh, to, the, to the genitive case and without any change in meaning. So that's a bad argument. The contradiction stands. And why not? Why shouldn't there be contradictions in the writings of fallible human beings? Are you defending a complete infallibility of these documents? I, I, I don't we're not here to far. debate the inerrancy of scriptures. We are here to debate the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, one and more the, question then. Yeah. Uh, will you answer my question or should I ask? Well, what's your question? Uh, you are aware of the fact that women were allowed to count as witnesses. Mm -hmm. They were allowed to give testimony in a court of law mm -hmm. in the first century. Uh, they didn't have as high a status as men because the Bible is a patriarchal sexist book and uh, the God of the Bible is a patriarchal sexist male and so was Jesus. But they were allowed to give testimony, and it is not surprising. It was the custom of the day for dead people to be tended by the women. The women were given that job. And whenever there was a, a in fact, they would sometimes go into mourning for one or two or three or four days. So it's not surprising that there would be women there. In fact, it would be surprising if there weren't. And the testimony of women was often regarded in, in high esteem. Even Jesus said that a woman... Uh, even the New Testament says that a woman can sue her husband for divorce, and you can't do that unless your testimony is worth something. So it seems like uh, parroting the testimony of these supposedly women whose tales seemed as idle tales mm -hmm. uh, is trying to give more credibility to the story. It doesn't seem very surprising at all to me, and I wonder why you would think that was important. Well, I'd say first of all that insofar as you hold that view that you've stated there, you disagree with the overwhelming majority of scholars. Well, then I do. Okay, and that's fine. I'm not saying it because the majority of scholars hold it that it's therefore true but I'm in my minimal facts that I presented tonight and the empty tomb wasn't one of those minimal facts but I did say about 75 percent of all critics granted it is well evidenced and the majority of critics in fact the main reason that they like the empty tomb is this this testimony of women issue there's um, um, an article written by um, a very highly critical uh, female scholar, I believe it's, she's from Princeton, Osiak. Anyway, she said that um, the, um, the testimony of women, yes, they could do so, but mainly in the first century, their testimony only was good in regards to women's matters, not when it came to things involving males. Um, and so the, I think the, the verse that you brought up in Luke is pretty telling of itself because you're right when Luke reports that when the women came and told the men about the empty tomb that they'd seen Jesus, they thought that they were telling silly tales. So even the Christian scriptures there seem to testify to the fact that men just didn't even regard the testimony of women as very valuable at all. Um, so in addition to those three arguments that I gave, I like the verse that you gave as well, and I think we could add that to the list. Um, about the testimony of women and how it, it showed in the first century, um, it was they weren't highly regarded. So the whole point is this: if the testimony of women was at best questionable, if you're inventing the empty tomb account, why on earth would you place as your primary witnesses people whose testimony isn't going to get you much mileage when you could have used the males? Well, then let me ask you this: in the earliest document, we're out of time. We're going to need to move to the mic. Okay. Oh, well, a second round of Mike asking questions, and then you can... Oh, okay, I get it. All right. Okay. Um, all right, you... Let's see. In your rebuttal, you mentioned about how did Jesus appear to Paul. We talked about that. By the way, I would also say that made a major reason why the appearance to Paul is different than it was to the disciples in the, in the Gospels is because it is a post-ascension appearance. Um, that could account for a lot. So I don't see any contradiction because of that problem right there. Um, you mentioned how in Galatians he said God revealed uh, his son in me. Well, I looked up a couple scholarly commentaries about that a while back, and it seems like a lot of commentators believe, in fact, the majority of commentators believe, that when pa Paul says, when God re was pleased to reveal his son in me, he's not referring to his conversion experience. He's referring to those three years after his conversion experience. Um, in Arabia before he went back up to Jerusalem to meet with Peter. So um, w without that, I, I, I don't think you've got um, much there again in terms of um, Paul having an hallucination. How, how would you explain Paul's experience? What happened there? 
You said an epileptic experience. Is that what you believe? It's he had possible. Epilepsy? What happened to him is consistent with an epileptic seizure. Mm -hmm. uh, seeing a bright light, getting blinded, falling off your horse, uh, having to, you know, recover. Free, that's consistent. We can't know. We can't go back and medically examine these people. We can't go back and psychoanalyze these people. But what we can do is we can show how experiences like the birth of Christianity are even happening today. Myths and legends, uh, stories and belief systems are happening all the time by fallible human beings. We all know what's happening. We see it in other religions. And we can see that psychological happenings or, or griefs or traumas or some kind of disconfirmation. Uh, Robert Price writes about this. You notice that a lot of religions uh, Take the Millerites and the Seventh-day Adventists, or take the Jehovah's Witnesses. Take a group that had predicted the end of the world, right? It was going to happen, just like the early Christians. Jesus is going to bring a kingdom on earth, right? It's going to happen. He's going to be our new king. He's going to be our savior. Well, with the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Millerites, their prophecies failed, right? Mm -hmm. They failed miserably. Uh, and they changed it from 1914, Charles Russell changed it, and then Rutherford said, oops, it wasn't 1914, it's 1925, and then oops, it didn't happen then. So what, did the Jehovah's Witness religion just disappear? It got stronger. After the disconfirmation of their expectations, the religion got stronger, right? And Robert Price points out in his book, uh, uh, Beyond Belief, I think that's the title of the book, that maybe a, a radical disconfirmation of your expectations is exactly what a fledgling religion needs to get off the ground. These, these original followers of this self-proclaimed Messiah named Yeshua maybe really believed that he was going to bring a new kingdom on earth. He was publicly executed. He, he was gone, and they felt horrible about it. What did they do? They go back, they regroup, they think it through, and... Uh, they come up with some way to keep the religion going and to save face. That happens. You admit that that happens. Mm -hmm. It happens today. It happened in the 1800s. It happens with, with other religions. So what made those people exempt? Were they special? Were they somehow more human than you and I? Were they somehow uh, uh, immune from this kind of exaggerations and all that? Uh, that is a plausible naturalist exp explanation, which you were asking for. Oh, you were wait, asking you for. I, I don't know that that's plausible in order to account for what happened here. I mean, certainly, yeah, the Jehovah's Witnesses kept going and everything. However, I mean, these guys weren't under necessarily threats of death. That would be one difference there. Um, they weren't having all these enemies, or people who were fighting against them, saying, "Oh, I saw Jesus too." I mean, we're talking about here. We can. We can establish that Jesus' disciples really believed that they saw him risen from the dead. We know it wasn't a hallucination, so you're saying here that they were doing it in order to save face or, or to, something like to that. avoid eating crow. Well, I can understand that kind of, I mean, we've all probably lied at some point in our lives in order to avoid eating crow. But here's the disciples, you know, in that day, the Romans, when they got you, I mean, I just completed a study on crucifixion. And it was a horrible, horrible process. If you want to read up on it, there's a, several good books out there. One in particular I'd recommend is written by New Testament critic Martin Hangel called uh, Crucifixion. Just an excellent resource on the subject. And um, so you see these things happening and what the Romans do, did to, to their victims in the whipping, the scourging, the crucifixion, the humiliation that took place. Um, now these disciples, they didn't want to eat crow, okay? So they made up this lie, and then one by one, they saw as they were being, um, you know, captured and persecuted. And then they ended up, uh, many of them, uh, we at least know several of them, uh, suffered martyrdom for their faith. And at least they were all willing to do that. We How do you know that. that? How do you know they suffered martyrdom? Well, first of all, you've got um, uh, Clement of Rome, who writes around the year 95, and he talks about the martyrdom of Paul and Peter. Um, a little bit later, you've got Polycarp who mentions the martyrdom of Paul and some of the other disciples and the fact that they were all willing to suffer. So the thing is, uh, I mean, that's a couple of them right there. Josephus reports the martyrdom of, of James. So... Um, 60, 70 years later, right? Well, so. Josephus writes that in 95 probably, but James is probably martyred in 62. And it's certainly within Josephus' lifetime because he's born around 37. So he would have been 20 some, maybe 25 years old at the time. At, right at the time when he had become a, a Jewish priest and uh, his dad was a very popular priest in Jerusalem. So that places Josephus in the geographic location in which this stuff would have happened. Um, he's aware of the high priest and everything. He would have probably been there. He may have even been an eyewitness to it. We don't know that, but he's certainly in a position to have known about this.
So um, we do know that these guys were willing to suffer and die for their beliefs um, that, uh, that Jesus had risen and appeared to them. And we've got Paul, same thing with him. We've got James, same thing with him. We've got to be able to account for their experiences. So when it comes to the sufferings of the disciples, yeah, maybe they, as a lot of us would, would lie to avoid eating crow. But I think that for the most part, people would rather eat crow than be eaten by lions. Um, and, and so I think that as one by one, they saw like Peter get thrown in jail, James stoned, and some, some of the others, uh, Stephen stoned. Um, I, I think what would happen is they would reassess their situation. Hey, did we really see him? Did we really see it? You know, when you were looking 20 years ago, you know, you're thinking about the rest of your life and you start to really assess, is my faith true? Well, and I can appreciate that. I went through that too. So the thing is, when your friends are getting hauled off to prison and you're seeing them brutally treated and then some executed, now you're really thinking even more seriously and you're trying to make a quick decision. I don't think so. I don't think that's how human nature is. Otherwise, those pilots of the planes that flew into the World Trade Center would have veered at the last second. Why is that? They believed strongly that they were going to go to their Islamic heaven. They were completely convinced that, that Muhammad had a miracle, that the recitations came through the angel Gabriel to Muhammad, and they were absolutely convinced to the point of giving their lives yep. for that belief, right? So the disciples were that convinced that Jesus had appeared to them. But do you believe that the angel Gabriel gave recitations to Muhammad? You don't, do you? No, but that's does different. Their, does their martyrdom convince you that, that Islam is true? It's different because the Muslims, just like Christians who would die for their faith today, believe based on the testimony of others. So we could be right or wrong. The disciples died for what they knew was either true or false. So there's a big difference. Liars make poor martyrs. I don't think so. I think, I think you can get caught up in a religion. You can get caught up in this thing. And you can believe in God so strongly that I'm going to give my life. I, mean, I dedicated my life for all those years. And I suffered somewhat from that, for this belief. And, and now what I know is a false belief. There, there is no evidence or good argument for God. And certainly you mean this, except this, for the five things I presented tonight that you can't answer? Well, which I rebutted quite clearly. They're pretty weak. They're not even ordinary evidence. So I, right, if you I, want to I, believe it... I would disagree it, with that. I think it's extraordinary. Well, it's, I don't. When this you have these and there are no plausible naturalistic explanations to account them, I think that makes it pretty strong. Well, the, the explanation I give is one possible plausible explanation and we could come up with others we don't have to know exactly what happened all we have to know is if, that things like this would you make it clear what your explanation is well this is one plausible explanation that the disciples suffered a radical disconfirmation of their expectations mm -hmm. Peter especially was really going through a trauma and so to make things right he prayed, he talked to, to Jesus in the spirit and then Jesus made things okay in his mind just like what happens with Christians and then he told his friends and he told everybody, I saw Jesus. And the friend said, oh, well, me too. I'm going to pray. Yes, I saw Jesus. Oh, me too. I'm going to pray. Yes, okay. that's what happens in churches all the time. Yes, it happened to me. Yes, So that explains God. the beliefs of the disciples, but it doesn't explain Paul because he's not wanting to see the risen Jesus. It doesn't explain James who's not wanting to see it. And it doesn't explain the empty tomb. Well, okay, they could all have different explanations. Paul saw something totally different. Yeah, so, I mean, it was so a totally different thing. If we and can expand the causes of hallucinations to anything at will, so everybody's hallucinating the risen Jesus for whatever reason you want. I don't think it was I don't a call that a plausible. It was not a hallucination. It was like an inner experience. Like when I used to pray, I used to think God was talking to me. I wasn't hearing a real hallucinatory voice, but I thought the Holy Spirit was talking to me. And I would have told you that Jesus was talking to me. And you would not have understood that as a physical voice, as a hallucination, sure. but as an internal religious spiritual experience, right? Mm -hmm. So what could have happened back there was similar. These, these people who were devout believers in God were praying and they're having these religious experiences in their mind. And not necessarily a hallucination, but next Sunday, on Easter Sunday, you're going to have hundreds and thousands of Christians agreeing that the Spirit of Jesus is with them in that room, right? right. They're going to all testify to that together. There's a kind of drama mentality that happens in religion where we all get on the same page and let's all agree, yes, he spoke to me too. And so that kind of thing happens now. Something like that could have happened then. And as, as Thomas Paine said, as long as we do have some pretty plausible explanations for the origins of a myth or, or a legend, then it is irresponsible to jump to a supernatural conclusion. You just don't have the goods there. You might you know, have a faith, but you don't have the evidence. I, I would agree with you that if... Allow you to change the subject if you like on our, for our last few minutes. All right. 
Uh, I just want to change the subject one, one way here. Um, do you agree with me that the number of extraordinary events in the resurrection narrative of Matthew and Luke is greater than the number of extraordinary events in the resurrection narratives of Paul and Mark? The number of the events. I, I would say in Paul, and I would say that the bulk of scholarship would, would be behind me on this. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 in that creed is not producing a resurrection narrative. That's not his intent. His intent is to answer the question posited by the Corinthian church, is there life after death? Are, are Christians, do we have an immortal soul? And in doing so, what he does is he lists a number of eyewitnesses who said, we saw the risen Jesus, to, and, and that happened to, again to both individuals, to groups, to friends, and to foes. And then he says, basically, because Christ lives, we will live as well. So his intent in 1 Corinthians 15 is not to produce a resurrection narrative. So to turn around and say we've got evolution because Paul didn't say this full-blown resurrection account in 1 Corinthians 15, I think, would, would be putting the theological cart before the horse. And when it comes to Mark, no, I, I wouldn't agree with, I mean, we've got some things like in Matthew, and, and Luke and John, that would be like guards, um, a, um, the earthquakes. Earthquakes, angels. No, no, no. I think we've got angels in Mark. We have one young man who might be an angel. Have, notice something else. You agree with me that as the, as the time passes, the number of angels increases. It right? um, starts with one young man, then it's, then it's one angel, then it's two young men, then it's two angels. You agree that as time passes, that number increases. I agree that the numbers listed in the Gospels... Uh, will change from one to two. However, I don't think that that necessarily means a contradiction there. But you agree that there's a growth, at least in the telling, not necessarily in the fact, but in the I telling. I don't know that I would even agree with that, Dan, because number one, when it comes to this uh, young man in Mark, um, you look in, in the ancient writings, and on multiple occasions, both in um, the Jewish um, Apocrypha as well as the New Testament, Men and young men on many occasions are referred to as... Yeah, as, I agree with that. It's, okay. it's possible that he was referring in, to what he thought was an angel. In, in fact, in Luke, it's a good example. In Luke chapter 24, I think it's verse 4, he calls it young men or men who were there announcing in this bright gleaming clothing, men. And then in verse 23, just a few verses later, he calls them angels. So they understood him in that sense. The fact that they're wearing bright clothes is used very... Uh, frequently in antiquity to refer to divine beings. So um, I don't see any contradiction whatsoever because some gospels say men are young men and the others say angels. And then as far as the two and one, hey, where you've got two, you've got one. Well, okay, but I'm just saying in the telling, in the actual document itself, there is an increase over time. Maybe that's not a contradiction, but you do agree that as the documents pass through the decades, the number of extraordinary events and the number of angels does increase across time. You might explain it some way, but there is a pattern of an ascension, an increase in extraordinary events as we get further and further away from the original. Well, what about the Gospel of Peter? What do you think of that? Well, the Gospel of Peter, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, you look at the resurrection account in that, and you find it's very embellished. Yeah. Um, I mean, you find these guys come to the tomb on Easter morning. Uh, all of Jerusalem's out there to see it. The bright light comes down. Uh, the stone rolls itself away. These two angels come down, go in the tomb, come out of the tomb. Their heads go up to the clouds. Jesus' head goes above the cloud. The cross comes hopping out of the tomb. The voice comes out of heaven and says, Did you preach to them that sleep? And the cross says, Yes, I did. So, you know, this is obviously a lot different than what we find in the Gospels. But it is embellished, right? And did Absolutely. it come early? When does it, was that written early or was that written late? Well, we have no evidence at all that the Gospel of Peter came before the third century. So, with so the it Gospels, was late. Sure. Right. Well, you know, the Westar Institute puts it maybe at 85 to 100. But, but the Westar Institute, the Jesus Seminar, just so everybody knows here, these are a group of very, of very highly critical scholars that are almost as on the far end spectrum, the left spectrum of the theological left as you can go. You, you can only go a little further than that, and that's like where Bob Price stands, and maybe five total five scholars in the whole world. Uh, who denied the existence and, of and Jesus. And what's wrong with that? Hmm? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with being a critical scholar? I don't think there's anything wrong, and I, I think Bob Price is a very smart guy. 
but I think that there's good reasons um, to believe in this data that I've presented here tonight because it is well evidenced. And just because you quote some of these guys on the far end of the theological left, well, they're on the far end, they're on the fringe. And so just, I mean, quoting a few guys, it'd be like saying, all right, well, this is what democracy should be like. And you say, well, no, it isn't. Here's what a few neo-Nazis said. I'm not saying these guys are neo-Nazis. I don't mean to imply that. But um, say, well, here's what a few neo-Nazis say. Well, fine, I'm glad to know what they believe, but I'll tell you what, I'll stick with me. These line. are 75 plus biblical scholars who know the languages, who have a PhD or an equivalent mm -hmm. in the languages and in the study and in the cultures of the time, who are not beholden to any religious group. They are independent scholars. Yep. They're not speaking for the Episcopal Church or for an evangelical organization. These are scholars who want to know what's true. And not only do they give their opinions, they give their reasons. Yeah, but they let's give look at their... for the most part, as anyone who wants to re read the debate between Bill Craig and John Dominic Crossan, I think is very telling. You know, he has an anti-supernatural bias. And no, he, he doesn't. John oh, Crossan does abs not. He, absolutely, because uh, Craig in the period like we're having here, he asked Cross and he says, um, it, do you believe God exists? Well, it, it's irrelevant. Well, during the Jurassic period, he says, do you believe that it's factually true that God exists? And Cross and said, well, no, I don't believe that. So he comes to the table with his with atheistic beliefs to begin with. Of course you rule out the miraculous. Crossan is not an atheist. You're wrong about that. I've read some of his works, and he does allow for miracles. Okay, so he doesn't believe God existed during the Jurassic period, and he's a theist? He believes in God now. Yeah, but he, he believes, believes in, in God. God in the sense that we believe in the American spirit. Well, there's no spirit, let's say, in America. We believe in the ideals of the American spirit. And it's the same thing with, um, like, we might believe in the spirit of Santa Claus, as Craig said, but we don't literally believe that there is a Santa Claus. And likewise, Crossan says, you know, he believes in God in the sense that he, he thinks it's um, a nice idea. But he doesn't believe that, that God factually exists. Well, I don't he either. He says it very clearly in that debate. I don't either. And why does that bias, why does that make you wrong? I mean, what's wrong with not believing? Why not come at it as an outsider, as a critic, rather than as a loyal believer who's trying to prove? Wouldn't you rather trust the outside critics than the inside critics? The outside Absolutely. critics would be rather to be trusted than those who are a part of the established authority of, of doctrine. And that's I why I have... like what, what uh, Ludemann and all the, you know, many of these critics who don't believe in the resurrection grant these five facts that I've given tonight. When did Ludemann write that quote that you read? Uh, that was in the 90s. I think it was 96. Because, you know, uh, he, he became an atheist just recently, like about three or four years ago. Yes, he did. And he might have written that back when he was a believer, and his views have changed somewhat since then. He's in, in Gottingen University. Well, now, he was, he was um, in that debate with Bill Craig. He became an atheist just after that. So, I mean, he was, he was toying with atheists at that point. So Bill uh, Craig turned him into an atheist. <laughs> well, I, I think as Mark Goodacre over at uh, Birmingham University in the UK says, when you see people like Ludemann, or in his case, he cited, um, I'm trying to think of the scholar that he did a PhD on, uh, Michael Goulder. He says, these guys, over time, you can see that they just have this. They're getting tired of considering the miraculous, and they have this emotional bent toward atheism, and they start moving in that direction. And it, as, um, as Goodacre says, it's not a matter of what the head told them. It's the heart's leaning in that direction, and then they use arguments, as I see that you've done, Dan, um, I see that you're using these arguments from this fringe in order to justify your view. And, and the assumptions that these are based on, I just don't see them as, as very rational. Well, I'm impressed with their scholarship. I really am. I look at it. Most of them are believing Christians. Oh, the Jesus God. Seminar. Yeah, I am impressed with their scholarship and their reasons and their evidences and their honesty and their willingness to change their mind. And if any of them do have an atheistic bent, I count that as a plus. Anybody who is willing to buck the status quo, anybody who has enough courage to stand up in this predominantly religious world and say, wait, I'm not going to believe that stuff, and no matter what threats of hell are made to me. Uh, I, I have a lot of respect for scholars like that. I just have two more questions, and then maybe we could go into a final. Uh, talking about Paul's formula in 1 Corinthians 15, I think... I think you're wrong about Paul's intent of that. Paul's intent in giving that passage was to establish his credentials with the church in Corinth. He wanted to show them, Peter saw Jesus, James saw Jesus, 500 people saw Jesus, and so did I. So I'm, I'm one of the insiders. Because how is he going to be accepted as an insider unless he had some kind of a authenticating experience? So his intent in giving that 
that formula. And by the way, historians will agree that the more formulaic something is, the less narrative it is, then the more legendary it is. And that earliest resurrection account we have in the entire New Testament is in a non-narrative. It's more like a hymn or like a recitation. It's one of the signs of legend when you present things in this sort of hymn-like... Uh, uh, I would disagree spread. with that. I would agree that it's a recitation. It is a creed. It's very uh, noticeable by the parallelism that's in there. But to say it's a legend, um, you have no evidence for that, and you wouldn't have but the, the consensus style, of scholarship. But the style is legendary. Not at all. It's, why it's, would you it's, say it's legendary? What, why it, would the Because style most be legends are given in a kind of poetic... Uh, hymn, sing-song, recitative kind of a way. When you tell the legend... Yeah, but so was the imparting of oral historical tradition, too. But see, that's... Have to, you got a burden of proof to show it was legend. But that's one of the arguments a lot of Christian historians give for the authenticity of the New Testament. It is that it's given in a non-legendary frame. It's given in more in a narrative. Mm -hmm. But here, the earliest resurrection account is given in a non-narrative in more legendary style. And, I'm sorry, and what, um, what evidence would you have that it's legend? Because Paul's saying he's I'm not a, saying that Paul's the, saying he's an eyewitness. I'm not saying that it is legend. I'm saying the style is legendary. The earliest thing we have on the resurrection is in a style that is unlike anything else. It's in a legendary, hymn-like, uh, you know, uh, recitative style. And then one last question. Well, by the way, you wouldn't have much scholarly consensus on that opinion. But go ahead. Well, I'm just repeating what Christian scholars say. Uh, no, you're repeating what a few of the scholars, and not all of them, of the Jesus Seminar would say. Okay, the, so whatever your interpretation, you do agree with me that that style of that formula in the earliest resurrection account is somewhat different from In fact, from the can rest. I read a quote from John Dominic Crossan of the co-founder of the Jesus Seminar on this? He says, Paul needs in 1 Corinthians 15, in agreement with you here, to equate his own experience with that of the preceding apostles. To equate that is its validity and legitimacy, but not necessarily its mode or matter. Paul's own entranced revelation should not be the modal model for all the others. So not only is Crossan saying here that Paul isn't necessarily saying, and Ludeman would agree with, no, Ludeman would not agree with this, but Crossan here is saying that um, Paul is not necessarily saying that his experience was just like the disciples. He's saying that the validity and the legitimacy of his experience was the same as the disciples. So he is, according to Crossan, your man here. He's saying that it is historical. He's not saying it's legendary. He said he appeared also to me. Paul wanted to be, you see his intent. He wanted to be accepted by the church at Corinth. And exactly. one final point, in that early- I'm glad you agree with my view then. I don't agree with your view. I'm agreeing that- But you in just this, agreed with Crossan here. Originally, you gave a different intention for Paul including that in 1 Corinthians. And I'm correcting you in saying that his real intention, as Crossan agrees, was to establish his credentials before his readers of a thousand miles away who had no idea knowing who this man was. Okay. And, Go on. Uh, quickly, okay. You also agree with me in that, that in that earliest resurrection account in 1 Corinthians 15, there are no women giving testimony. That's correct. Okay. Again, Paul is not doing a resurrection narrative there, so we wouldn't expect him to do that. He doesn't mention Pontius Pilate. He doesn't mention the thieves. He doesn't mention a number of other events. He doesn't mention that this happened by Pontius Pilate on the eve of the Passover during the reign of Tiberius Caesar, which is mentioned by uh, Tacitus and Josephus. But those, what we have in the Gospels are resurrection narratives. That's not what Paul's intending to do here. But you at least agree that they are absent. They could have been there. Peter was there, James was there, but, and the women could have been there, but they weren't. They're absent from the earliest testimony. Right, because it's not Paul's intent to give a resurrection Whatever narrative. the reason, they're not there. Great. So I'm, I'm glad you admit that at least all the disciples, Paul and James, believed Jesus rose and appeared to them. They, Peter, Paul, and James, if they existed, believed that Jesus rose spiritually to heaven, not bodily. Okay. Thank you for a very uh, rigorous and uh... <laughs> okay. Uh, questions for Dan, please use this, uh, excuse me, questions for Mike, please use this uh, microphone here. Questions for Dan on this side. And I would encourage you, please, to make your questions uh, concise and to a particular point. 
And I would also encourage the speakers to make have your answers do the same so we can uh, field as many questions as possible. Uh, let's start with Mike, since we've been doing that all night. Uh, you said the debate is not up to the uh, resolution. Uh, I think the Um, that's a great, am I on here? Um, I think that's a, a great uh, a question you bring up about inerrancy there. Um, I believe in the inerrancy of the Bible according to the Chicago Statement of Inerrancy. I don't have time to get into that, but you can look that up online through a, a search engine, Chicago Statement of Inerrancy. And if you look at Article 13 in there, it, it, I think it will explain some of what I, my view would allow in terms of inerrancy. But um, I don't think... It, you say, well, what about the, um, if there are some tensions in the gospel accounts uh, concerning the resurrection narrative, um, do these call into question the resurrection itself? And I don't think so. And in fact, Dan himself would admit this because in his book, Losing Faith in Faith, he makes the statement, he says, do these accounts, uh, he says that the, the what he, he perceives as contradictions, he says, these do not disprove the resurrection. Um, and so that's what we're looking at tonight. We're not dealing with the uh, details of the resurrection narrative, such as uh, um, how many angels were there with one or two in your area, and so on all the way. These are other details about the accounts. Um, and I think that these can be reconciled for the most part. But even if I'm wrong on that, we're still looking at the thing about um, where the basic layer of historical truth. And like I mentioned, with the burning of Rome, Cassius and Suetonius, both mentioned the great fire of Rome, but they differ significantly on the details and parts of them. Nevertheless, we can still believe the fire and sepulchre. So even if all of the purported contradictions that they have had in gospel resurrection accounts, even if they were valid, I don't think that they are. It really wouldn't matter because the five normal facts that I presented, five facts from them, still stand. Um, maybe the resurrection contradictions don't disprove the resurrection, but they do throw serious doubt on the credibility of these reports. In a court of law, that's exactly what you would do to a testimony. You would cross-examine. You would see if a testimony had contradictions within it. And when you see, I have 17 contradictions here that are really good. Matthew said the women came to the tomb when the sun had risen, but John said when it was dark different list of women, a different purposes were given. Was the tomb open when they arrived? Matthew says no, but the others say yes. Who was at the tomb? Different angels, dip, situated in different places. What were the messages? Different messages were given. Did the women tell what happened afterwards? In one case it said yes, but in another case it said no, they didn't. Uh, when, when did Mary first see Jesus? Was it before or after she returned to the disciples? Could Jesus be touched after the resurrection? Where did Jesus first appear to the disciples? Was it on a mountain in Galilee or was it in a room in Jerusalem? On and on and on and on, we see that under cross-examination, these witnesses would be seriously compromised in their reliability. If they're wrong about this, if they're so sloppy on the supposedly most important document to the world, then what else can we, can we throw at them? I mean, you have to admit it is a pretty sloppy way to get an important message. I agree with a lot of those alleged contradictions that you've just named. Yeah, my question was, uh, you had made a couple of references to uh, the fact of Peter being a liar, and um, one, at one point you'd use that as a, a reasonable enough uh, you know, fact that, to denounce his claim altogether. I was just wondering how uh, you could put faith in, in that, those claims at all. How do you know that Peter was a liar? I, I didn't really hear. Did you understand what he was I saying? I didn't understand it either. How about, the, how about this? Yeah. You had uh, made a reference a couple of times to Peter being a liar, and one time you used that as reason enough to you know, not believe in his claim. I was wondering how you uh, yourself believe or have put faith in the fact that Peter was a liar. How did I put faith? Well, if you, if you believe the document, if you believe the story that's given in the New Testament, Peter told an admitted lie that everyone knows was a lie. Now, if you don't believe the, the document, then we, we can throw the whole thing out, which would be fine with me. I mean, it's a nice story about how this legend started. But uh, you either take the document at face value or you don't. Peter told a lie. You, we all admit that our first witness to the resurrection 
was an admitted liar just a couple days before that, who was under mental stress, under trauma. He was a hot-headed guy. He cut off a soldier's ear. He was rash. He was uneducated. I mean, is he the kind of guy you would have, want to have on a witness stand for an important criminal trial? I don't think so. Then would you uh, acknowledge the fact that Jesus made a claim before Peter made those lies that he predicted that would go ahead and happen? So Jesus predicted that Peter would lie? It says so in all four Gospels, just like it says so about Peter lying, which I'm assuming so, that's so where Peter you had no choice. He had to lie. Well, I mean, he made the claim, and it would seem that Jesus is an extraordinary person. That's why we're all here, right? Well, okay, even if he had the gift of prophecy, it doesn't change the fact that Peter's responsible for his own actions, right? And if Jesus knew that he had such poor character that he was going to lie, and he said so, that still doesn't help Peter's credibility as a witness. His credibility is severely compromised. He's a liar. He knew that if he were to admit to it in that very moment, that he probably too would find himself up on a cross, and that would probably be reason, because at that point, they hadn't had enough belief, right? The sign hadn't been fulfilled, that if Jesus were to rise from the dead, then they would put their faith in that. At that point, he was still maybe a little skeptical. Well, then Jesus didn't do a very good job of instructing his disciples, did he? They couldn't even stick with him after all these years of training. They didn't have enough faith in his teachings and his example. Hey, he's not a very good leader then, is he? Right. At the end, it is about faith, right? And, and you yourself have put your faith in your belief, just like Peter had to figure out how to no, do this. No, I don't have a faith in it. I'm saying taking it at face value, it's probably false. The story is probably false. But if we're going to take that story as testimony, then we also have to take the other testimony that compromises the testimony. Let's, uh, let's give Mike a chance at that. It seems to me, I think um, it's kind of interesting, your question there. It seems to me that Dan is approaching a cafeteria approach to the Bible, that you pick and choose what you want. I mean, on the one hand, you talk about discrepancies in the Bible and the resurrection account, so let's just throw out the whole thing. It's just all or nothing. But it, it, on the other side of your mouth, you're saying, Peter's a liar. Well, if you're going to reject all of it because of the res uh, discrepancies in the Gospels, why would you accept the part of Peter lying? It seems like that just uh, takes out the foundation for your objection to Peter being a liar. And then I also say that uh, this thing about liar, I think it's so overblown, Dan. I mean, come on, the guy was facing torture and execution, but the fact is he repented and he followed Jesus for the next 30 plus years, served as head of the church, um, had a tremendous impact. Um, I mean, we've all made mistakes in our lives, no question about it. It's being able to pick ourselves up, uh, brush the dust off, go with the forgiveness of God, and move ahead. And that's, per that's especially what Peter did. I think rather than looking at him as a, uh, um, a bad witness, we ought to look at him as a good example about a guy who fought, fell face down in his Christian life, accepted the forgiveness of Christ, and went forward. I have a short comment and then a question for Mike. Uh, due to medieval history, there were at least three dozen pre-Jesus uh, gods that were born of a Christian, of a, uh, 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 virgin. a virgin mother. They died and they rose from the dead. At least three dozen of them. Now the question is, according to history, how could this myth of mythical Jesus have been crucified if he died in three hours and rose in three days, when it took at least six days of torture and pain before death would come on crucifixion? Furthermore, uh, he would not have been impaled by a spear uh, that would not have been a true crucifixion. So how could this Jesus have been crucified and still, oh, it only took three hours. I mean, they were, they were supposed to hang on, the, on these crosses for at least six or seven days. But Jesus was something different. But there was a whole line of guys being crucified at the same time, I understand. Okay. Thank you for your comment and question, first of all. Um, in terms of the dying and rising gods in mythology, I, I would say that some good studies have been done on that. Gunther Wagner in his Pauline Baptism and the Pagan Mysteries. Uh, Edwin Yamauchi has done some studies. So has Bruce Metzger. Gary Habermas has done some study. Resurrection claims in non-Christian religions. And in an article published, I believe, last year in Philosophy Christi, he replied to Evan Fales with some information about that. 
bottom line is this, with the exception of Osiris, there isn't a single account of a dying and rising God that precedes Christianity. They all come after the writing of the New Testament. And um, this has been documented in those works. Um, now I'd also say in terms of the crucifixion, um, I think that Jesus was on the cross for, for six hours, if I remember right. But even if that's the case, you're, you're right. Jesus did seem to die quite um, ahead of time sooner than most crucifixion victims did. I don't know six or seven days would be common. In my study in crucifixion, I didn't find anything. It would say days, but it didn't say how many. Um, and it was a very, very brutal process, I agree. But if you recall, the Jews of the period, according to the New Testament accounts, and in fact, according to the, uh, the Talmud, it says he was hanged on the eve of the Passover. Um, and again, the, the New Testament ha Gospels have that as well. If that's the case, the Jews would have been correct in saying they don't want him hanging on the cross. And so they would have, like the Gospel said, went and did the uh, cura fragium of breaking the legs, which was um, a, a method described. And the reason they would do that is so the per person couldn't push up against their feet, which had been nailed in order to exhale and inhale, and they would simply asphyxiate. So. That would also explain the point you bring up. It would explain why Pilate was surprised when Joseph of Arimathea went to him and um, requested the body. He was surprised that he had died already. Let me just respond real quickly to the thing about the pagan parallels. In, in the second century, in the year 150, there was a Christian apologist who wrote these words to the pagans. Listen to this. When we Christians say that the word who is the firstborn of God, was produced without sexual union, and that he, Jesus Christ our teacher, was crucified and died and rose again and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you pagans believe regarding those whom you esteem sons of Jupiter. Here is a second century Christian telling the pagans that what we are proclaiming is nothing different from what you pagans believe. And you admit that Osiris was uh, one of those who uh, was written before, but the the yes, date. But it's the, not really a resurrection. But the dating of the writings doesn't mean that those things were not believed before that time. Dionysus was uh, a god, who uh, who died and rose again. Uh, Mithra was another one who had twelve disciples, and who had a last supper with his twelve disciples, who was cut from a rock and who died and rose from the dead. So that you can see that the Jesus, and that wasn't a major part of my argument tonight, but you can see that the Jesus legend is cut from the same fabric as all these other myths and legends. Anybody who was anybody in those days was born of a virgin and ascended to heaven. Even, even Augustus Caesar, Suetonius wrote that Caesar Augustus ascended to heaven when he died. I mean, it was really a mark of honor to be somebody who ascended to heaven. So that's a, that's a strike against the uniqueness of the uh, Christian message. I don't think so, because when he said he ascended to heaven, he's talking about, about Suet, or Augustus, and Suetonius says, that there was one person who believed, he swore he saw Augustus ascending in the flames. And, um, he, you know, he, as you know, he mentions a similar account about uh, Julius Caesar being in a comet and going to heaven that way. But these are easily explained by naturalistic explanations, a comet or a hallucination. Um, and, you know, Suetonius would even say the comet himself. You can't explain that, that with the resurrection. All, there are no plausible naturalistic explanations. I just gave you a few tonight. I didn't hear it's it. It's up to you to decide if they're plausible. For me, they are very plausible. All right. My question, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, or Dan? Um, oh, there it is. Okay. Um, one of your arguments against the resurrection is that there's little to no eyewitness testimony of evidence for the resurrection, right? Is that correct? Of the resurrection itself. Right. Okay. Um, if, that's, if that's the case, if the resurrection was a lie, it's like the greatest hoax of all time, or a great hoax. Um, what eyewitness evidence, what credible eyewitness evidence uh, do you have that Christ did not raise? Um, and who was giving, bringing this evidence? What, where were they and where's, their, where, where's the written documents of, of this evidence? And why weren't at least some believers, and maybe some of the disciples, speaking out against uh, about this, if they knew it was a lie, if they're credible people at all? Maybe one of them or, or some of them might have spoke out against it. They were a, f a fanatical religious sect. They were people who traveled the country behind a religious teacher. They left their homes. These, these, these were people, of, they were uneducated, most of them, of a mindset 
to become, follow this Messiah. And so they were primed to believe anything that would help further their cause that they had dedicated themselves to. It's not my job to prove a negative. I would ask, if, if, if this message is so important, if there really is a God and he really wants us to know that Jesus died and rose from the dead, why doesn't he do it again? Why doesn't he do it now when we have video cameras? Why doesn't he go on Oprah Winfrey and say, hey, I died and I'm back again? Why do we have to rely on this ancient, distant, misty, uh, unreliable historical testimony that e we can't even agree on? It, and you even admit it could be contradictory in some places and still be true. I, I would ask, if it's so important, why don't we know it for sure? We don't know it for sure. You don't know it for sure. You believe it because as a Christian, you want to be a, on the bandwagon with other Christians because it's a good thing. But you don't know what happened. You weren't there. Um, okay, there we are. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not on, okay, for, for one thing, I don't feel like I'm on the bandwagon and trying to go with the other Christians. I disagree with that, and you don't really know what I believe or what I decide, so don't try to do that. But, uh, I mean, yes, there are people who actually believe that it's true for other reasons other than getting on the bandwagon. There might be some of them, too, but there are definitely people who have enough evidence. Like this? Like, like what he gave tonight? Sure, what he gave tonight. That convinces I've, you? Life, I've been, I'm very convinced. But my question to you is, where is your evidence that, that where are the people who did speak out? Maybe the disciples didn't, but where, give us some facts. Like Mike gave us a whole bunch of uh, people that weren't Christians who said that they believed that the resurrection happened. Where are the Christians or the people, this uh, outside critics who um, spoke out against the resurrection? Mike and gave your, us your credible historical evidence. Mike gave us no evidence of any first century doubter or critic who, who questioned or mentioned or even pro or con outside of the, the testimony of the followers in the New Testament. All he gave us was things from second century and later. And so, uh, and even if we allow for a little bit of Josephus in the year 95, that's really late. So I would say the evidence, absence of evidence is evidence of absence. Because if something truly doesn't exist, the only evidence you would have for its non-existence would be a lack of evidence for its existence. So I give to you the lack of evidence of corroborative testimony within the first century as my argument. I mean, if there were something, you would have used it, right? You'd be trumpeting it. You'd be saying, look, here's this person who lived in the year 40 who disagreed. You'd be using that, but you don't have it. All you have is the New Testament and a couple of extra canonical books, uh, that uh, you, you, like the Gospel of Peter, that you do discard because you think... By, by the way, who wrote the Gospel of Peter? It was a Christian, right? Had to be a believer, right? Probably. Which is evidence that the Christians very early on were tampering with the story. There was that tendency among Christianity to tamper, to edit, to exaggerate. So the very existence of the Gospel of Peter shows that that kind of stuff was going on. Editing, redacting, tampering, exaggerating. That's my evidence. Yeah, it went on later on, perhaps. But that doesn't mean that that's what was going on in the Gospels. And besides, I really haven't even appealed to the Gospels tonight. My appeal has been to the very early sources, the eyewitness testimony of Paul himself, the early creed in 1 Corinthians 15, the Acts sermon summaries. These are fat things in which the majority of scholars do agree on. Um, and that's why I'm trying to appeal to this basic layer so we don't get into this thing about legendary development. It's irrelevant in our discussion tonight because it's these other sources which are extremely early and come from the eyewitnesses themselves. So you can accuse them of lying or hallucinating or something, but you can't say it was legend because, again, it's it goes back to the eyewitnesses themselves. So even though Dan tonight has on a couple occasions said second, third, fourth-hand witness, just a moment ago he said uh, the earliest is second century, that's false. We've got the Apostle Paul that goes back to the first century, said he saw Jesus. We've got the creed that's dated within five years of the crucifixion. Um, we've got the sermon summaries that scholars normally date within 15 to 20 years of the crucifixion. These are very early. But they're in the New Testament. That was my point. Certainly. They are, they are New Testament documents. Yeah. There's nothing outside the New Testament. Well, I mentioned a couple. You've got Josephus. Um, and you're saying he's late, but he's still growing up. He could have certainly, he's in a position to be an eyewitness to so the disciples. So that passage about Jesus, that pass, you agree that that passage about Jesus that appears in Josephus does not appear before the 4th century. That passage um, is absent from his antiquities before the 4th century, the time oh, of Eusebius. Oh, no, not at all. In fact, but the passage I refer to had to do with the stoning of James, which is in book 20, section oh, But 200. we're talking about the resurrection. Right, but I was saying the stoning of James, 
because James was willing to die for his belief. That's where I use Josephus. Now, if you want to refer to the testimony in Flavianum in Book 18, Section 3, I would agree with the majority of Josephus scholars today that there are some Christian interpolations in that passage, maybe as many as three. However, the passage itself, the majority of critics, according to Louis Feldman, he told me this personally, and Louis Feldman is the leading, he's a Jewish scholar, he's not a Christian, and he's the leading Josephus scholar in the world. He told me personally that three to one, perhaps even as high as five to one, Josephus scholars today believe that that passage, in that passage, Josephus is aware of, jo of Jesus. And he mentioned several things about him. So you're, ag you're agreeing that Christians tampered with historical documents? Yes, I would agree with that. In terms of Josephus, that did happen. We don't know when it happened, but the whole thing is we go back to that historical core and we can see Josephus does mention Jesus. So and Christ that's what I'm appealing to tonight. So Christians did tamper with the evidence. And the legend evidence. is not necessarily a, a thing because we can go back to this basic layer of historical truth. That's what I'm saying. My question was, um, you you talk about, or you had the basic, the five points that you made, uh, or five basic points to support the resurrection, right? Um, I just wanted to clarify, um, did you, that uh, one of the points that you made was that there were a lot of scholars endorsed these five points, uh, including even some, you know, who weren't Christians, who were atheists and who didn't believe in the resurrection, right? Yes. Um, doesn't the fact that they, believe the five points and yet still don't believe in the resurrection, doesn't that kind of hurt your argument to a small extent? I'm, I mean, where does that fit in? Like, you're, you're endorsing the five points, but at the same time there are people who endorse the five points but who don't agree with the resurrection. How does that uh, conflict? I don't know. I think that's an excellent question you ask and I appreciate you asking it. I think it's a very fair question. You know, why is it that these, scholar, or these scholars who are non-believers, even atheists, can agree with the five points I've presented tonight and yet not come to the conclusion of resurrection. I think this is what we're looking at and this is in a terms of historiography and how we draw conclusions and this is what my PhD work is on. And, and basically, you have these different kind of conclusions. What I'm saying and the argument I've presented tonight is when you have a number of people, you got the fact that and because this is well evidenced and granted by virtually all critics who study the subject, even the skeptical ones, you got Jesus' death by crucifixion, you got the fact that afterward a number of people said they saw him in groups and individuals, the friends, the foes, and finally the fact that there are no plausible naturalistic explanations, and I'll agree with Dan, that's going to be up to you guys to determine on your own whether or not his naturalistic explanations are plausible. Um, I could say they're implausible, he could say they're plausible. You have to determine for yourself. Um, I can say by and far the majority of critics today reject most of the naturalistic explanations uh, or the ones that Dan have, has presented. By far the majority of critics today are in a position where they say, like Paula Fredrickson of Boston University, hey, they saw something, but I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw. Um, I can't say whether or not it was a resurrection, but I do know that they saw something, and that's where they stopped. I think we can go further than that. And in the absence of any plausible naturalistic explanations, I see no reason for concluding that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, but I think it's an excellent question you ask. There's nothing implausible about the explanation that I offered. I'm not saying it was true, but the explanation that I gave is perfectly Plausible. You agree that it happens in human cultures. You agree that legends and myths start. The explanation I gave today is perfectly plausible in naturalistic terms. You might reject it, but you cannot say it is an implausible explanation. They believed that Jesus spiritually ascended to heaven, not bodily. That is plausible, right? The that problem is, is we've already looked at what the Greek and everything says there in the other passages. And no, I think based on the Greek in those passages, it's implausible. At this point, there was a momentary break in taping in order to change tapes. As a result, one question and the majority of Mike's answer were omitted. The questioner directed his question to both Mike and Dan. The question was, is it possible to obtain unbiased information? We have asked Mike to reproduce his answer to the best of his recollection. I admit that, just as today, virtually every author in antiquity carried his own personal biases and interests. But that doesn't mean that we can't arrive at any historical conclusions. The Oxford University historian A. N. Sherwin-White wrote that it is the role of the professional historian to comb through the data
identify biases, compare the data with other accounts, and identify kernels of historical truth in those accounts. Sherwin White says that the historian can locate these kernels in the worst of third-hand sources. I'll add, though, that we have something very strong with the testimonies of Paul and James. Before believing that the risen Jesus had appeared to each of them, Paul was out persecuting the church, and James, a pious Jew, apparently wanted no part in what his brother Jesus was doing. Then suddenly they did a complete about-face and became Christian leaders who died willingly for their faith because they sincerely believed that Jesus had appeared to them risen from the dead. Now it's easy to miss grasping how profound these testimonies are. I think an equivalent scenario today would be to hear that someone like Osama bin Laden begins preaching on the streets of Pakistan. Brothers, hear me. What I did in leading terror was wrong. And then he goes on to say that while hiding in the mountains of Afghanistan, Jesus appeared to him and told him he was following a false religion and that Jesus was the Messiah and risen Son of God. Imagine him giving such a public testimony and that he continued to do so until he's finally martyred for his newfound Christian faith. That's pretty much what we have with Paul. Now, James isn't quite as dramatic, but he might be like a serious and upstanding rabbi today who all of a sudden becomes a Christian because he believes the risen Jesus appeared to him. That's what we have with Paul and James. So I think that we have some very good testimony that would be unbiased to begin with. Did, did you want to ask a question again and see if Dan would like to respond? Do you, do you think that um, it's, po it's possible to get unbiased information on a subject with such a dichotomy as this? Yes, it is. I was a true believer. I preached the resurrection of Jesus. I put my life on the line for Jesus, and I lived the Christian life. And as I read the scholarship, as I read the reasonings that are given by the critical scholars, and I looked at the unbiased, open historical evidence, I changed my mind. It's possible to do that. It's painful psychologically, but I would rather go with the truth than to pretend to believe in some pie-in-the-sky myth that will make me live forever or whatever. I'd rather go with the truth than with the lies of history. So, so I guess like now when both of you when you're looking for evidence, now is that evidence, is that evidence valid? That you obviously both have distinct views? Well, we're looking at the same facts, but we're looking at it different ways. So, are you asking if um, we have personal biases? Well, obviously you do. Sure. So then when you look at, because I mean, several times now you've had the same thing and you both had completely different views on it. So, I mean, it, it seems that that shouldn't just not be valid. Then because it, well, that's human nature. History is interpretive. History is not, the, history is the weakest of all the sciences, of all the legitimate sciences. History gives us knowledge that is less confidence than any other science. We do have confidence at some level, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent, but the information we get through history is much less secure than the information we get through other sciences. So there Except has to psychology. Be... I, that's not a legitimate science. <laughs> um, in regards to that, I think, like, they're proving now the uh, Newton's laws of thermodynamics incorrect through astronomical data of uh, dark matter, but that's another, it's another story altogether. Um, what, um, what I wanted to ask was, you referred to the point that Christ was more likely impaled on a pole than he was crucified on a cross, and I was just wondering where you got the data for that. Okay, I don't think that's an important point. I really don't. He was publicly executed in some way, right? That's all that Christians care about. He was public, what does the shape have to do with it? If it turns out that it was a stake, it wouldn't change anybody's faith. He still died and rose from the dead, right? But that word stavros in the Greek uh, is, a, is where we get the word staff. It's, the, it's, a, it's a stake, it's an impaled, uh, you know, like a, like a skewer. And there is no Christian art that has any T-shaped Roman cross in it before the 5th century. Before then, Jesus was like a shepherd or a fisherman. The idea of a T-shaped uh, uh, method of, this, of execution came later in Christianity. And in fact, uh, Roman custom was that people would be publicly stuck up on a stick or on a pole. And some of them might have had some crossbeams in that, but uh, 
Christians in the second, third, and fourth century weren't talking about the cross, the T-shaped cross then. It only came later after uh, coming in contact with Tammuz, uh, the pagan god Tammuz, which did have that Tau symbol, the T-shaped. And then we start seeing that Christian cross around the sixth or seventh century. So, but I don't think it matters. If it was a T-shaped cross, it doesn't change my argument at all. I was just throwing that out as a, I mean, should it matter what the shape was? Is this on? Okay, now it's on again. <laughs> um, I think that the cross does matter. This is just why I'm bringing it up, because of the fact that if the cross was incorrect, then the whole biblical resurrection would be more likely incorrect, because the cross is a key point to Christ's death and resurrection. And I'm also wondering now on the fact of the fact that um, Peter was um, crucified upside down, and there's other... Um, data outside of biblical reference that refers to that. So if crosses weren't existent until the 4th, 5th century, then how could Peter have been crucified upside down? Upside down, right side up. So what? There, there is no word cross in the New Testament. That's an English word. The word is stavros, and that does not refer to a T-shaped instrument of execution. That's just the word stavros. You might think it's a T-shaped cross, but why is that important? He, he was executed on something, right? So th it, it might be important to show that today these crosses you see on top of churches, it's an imposter, but it doesn't matter. It's come to represent what modern Christians think is the symbol of their religion. The steeple and the spire itself are borrowed from paganism. They're phallic symbols piercing the heaven. There's no steeples, there's no spires, there's no crosses in the Bible itself. This is later Christian tradition that's built upon what you believe. Um, I would agree with Dan on two things there. Number one, I would agree that the Greek word stauros does not necessarily refer to a T. Um, it is used of many different things. In fact, it's even used not only of a stake, but it's used of the stockades that Peter's feet were put in, in Acts, uh, when he was in jail. So there's nothing in that Greek word that would imply a cross. I would also have to agree with Dan that um, the shape of the cross wouldn't have anything to do uh, in impacting the resurrection because if I remember correctly, I, I don't believe the Gospels say that it was a T. Um, that comes from medieval paintings. However, I do believe that Dan is mistaken in his facts once again when he says that there is no um, reference to, to uh, T-shaped cross prior to the 6th or 7th century. Uh, two early writers, Barnabas and Lucian, who write between the year 70 and 135, both mention how the cross was patterned after the Greek letter tau, or which is RT. Um, moreover, you've got uh, gemstones that date from the second and third century that archeologists discovered, which depicted, they were ancient jewelry and they, they depicted Jesus crucified and they showed the cross beam. Um, you also have graffiti that dates to the middle part of the third century, which depicts a cross beam as well. So I think he is- cross beam, I've seen that. No, no it's, it's like this, it's like the T. Um, now, in terms of Peter being crucified upside down, we, we do have that, I believe, from Clement of Alexandria, who writes around the year uh, 210 to 220, something like that. But his death is mentioned earlier uh, by Clement of Rome in the year 95, but he doesn't mention the manner of his death. So, um, again, I would agree with Dan on two of the things, and I would disagree with him on the shape of the cross. But I would agree with you that it's, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Hi, um, I think I got kind of a comment from both of you and a question, so I just give me a second. Um, I wanted to give you a little more credit than I think people are giving you because you're arguing completely within the bounds of Christian mythology to negate it without having to stretch to, you know, whether God exists at all, because that is another huge, huge problem for Christianity or for anything. Uh, Christianity is a religion that believes it's right, and that's one of my huge problems with it because I think you gave a little undue credit to the situation of Paul falling off his horse, seeing uh, the actual physical, whether it be the post-physical or pre-physical body. It's still different, and if, you know, it just seems much more likely that it was not, you know, actual physical. And if you're saying that it was actual physical, heaven physical, then it's still not a uh, natural, like, explanation. It's not actual, you know, physical body. It's a heavenly 
And I think, again, that since Christianity is something that believes it's completely right, and he did offer a completely plausible naturalistic explanation, was, which was, you know, people lie, people exaggerate, and that you, you can't say that's not a very good possibility. And, you know, with that, it throws a huge shadow of doubt over whether it is right, not necessarily whether, you know, we should believe it's right. I appreciate your comments. I, I would say in terms of, again, in what Dan did offer to say they lied, they exaggerated, the fact that they were all willing to go to their deaths for this, I think, would indicate that they, they really weren't intentionally lying about this. And, and the, the fraud hypothesis has been rejected by nearly every single scholar out there today for that reason. Moreover, even if the disciples were lying, that would have been the first thing that Paul and James would have suspected. I mean, today, you all remember David Koresh. Well, what if it was all of a sudden reported? He predicted his resurrection, by the way. And what if David Koresh's uh, dental remains and skeletal remains from the fire were turned up missing? Well, none of us would think that he rose from the dead. We would say that someone stole the, the remains. Well, likewise, that would have been the first thing that Paul and James, and Paul especially, that they would have jumped to the conclusion of. Nevertheless, both of them claim that they experienced a post-mortem appearance of Jesus. So the fraud theory just really fails. Um, and in terms of Paul with this appearance, um, you know, we, we should lay that to rest. That is in Acts. Paul never mentions that in his writings. It's only mentioned in Acts 2, 22, and 26. So if we're going to talk about Acts, great, um, because there's enough in there where we can say others did see the light. Um, and uh, I know Dan disagrees, but the majority of critics are going to say that, yeah, they also heard the voice, but they didn't understand it. So there were multiple people there. So you couldn't say that he's experiencing some um, extra mentally or, or uh, an event that was not extra mental, like in a hallucination or a, a subjective vision of a sort. Um, and if you go to Acts chapter 13, since we are talking about Paul and we're granting the appearances to Paul in Acts here, if we're going to do that, Paul is very clear in Acts 13 when he's preaching and he says, um, Jesus died and was buried. So was, so was King David, but his, David's body decayed in his grave. On the other hand, Jesus' body did not decay in the grave, and he cites Psalm chapter 2, I think it's verse 8, um, to show that Jesus' body not decaying in the grave was a fulfillment of prophecy. And he says, but he rose up and there were eyewitnesses to this. You couldn't get any more clearer than that, that Paul believed in bodily resurrection. And again, the majority of critics today would agree that um, regardless of what Paul saw in the sky, he believed Jesus rose from the dead and that Paul did believe in bodily resurrection. Those men who were with Paul did not testify. We don't have their names, we don't have their words. We have Paul saying this and Luke saying that. So we don't have independent corroboration of what happened. Another possibility, may or may not be true, is that Paul was struck by lightning. And the people who were with him would have seen a light and heard a loud noise and Paul would have been struck blind and had to recuperate for a while. That's a natural possibility. They didn't understand the voice of the lightning? Well, the sound, that word phony can be the sound. When Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock, if you hear the knock, he used that word phony, phony, right? It doesn't necessarily be a voice, but a sound. So um, that is a possibility that he was struck by lightning and had, and what happens when you're, I mean, he was kind of an unstable guy when you read his writings. I mean, the things he talked about, about his attitude towards women and all, I mean, he's kind of a weird guy. So a man like that, who's going to persecute people, who's going to be struck by lightning, who's, who could have a religious experience, that's plausible. I mean, that's naturalistic. We can't go back and recreate it, but things like that could happen. It's hard to say, though. I mean, you've given myths or you're wanting to continue on, and then Paul struck by lightning. What happened to James? Well... We have somebody else. We've got else. this really neat combination theory that's coming together here. We don't have time. James telling us what happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have the story, right? We have somebody later, in later years, writing this down. So we've got the creed in so 1 James, Corinthians 15. James we've got Paul going to Galatia, and he says he talked to Peter the Hysteresi, and he met James there, so he would have known from James yeah, personally. But James may have believed, just like the World Trade Center bombers believed in what they were doing. James may have been a true believer. It's possible. Hello, hello. Hey. Um, just uh, for the last four questions, I um, uh, ask that you make it real quick. Um, one question, and then uh, the debaters get okay. a little, little bit. I think we, we don't want to rebuttal. <laughs>
think that's what we don't want to be. Okay, um, I have a question more for you and then a comment. Uh, in the beginning when you were talking about the resurrection, you had stated that uh, it wasn't extraordinary and part of that was because the disciples didn't act as if it was an extraordinary thing that when they stated that Jesus was resurrected they kind of were like no he didn't you know and they didn't treat it as something extraordinary and then later on you go on to say that part of why the, the resurrection story took off was because the people over exaggerated because of their religious fervor now I might be misinterpreting this but it seems like you're using two different lines of reasoning and one saying that they didn't act appropriate as it being extraordinary and then one saying that they over exaggerated and were religious fervor is what was propagating the resurrection and God is going to have Jesus come back. It says so in Revelation, and we do have TV cameras, so we'll be able to catch it the second time. Well, you. <laughs> well, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, I will only say, I used to preach that sermon, so I know how you feel. I know exactly how you feel, but um, if the resurrection of Jesus was so powerful to them, and if it really happened, why did they wait 49 days? before they started talking about it, you know? Why wouldn't they get out right away? Why did, why, why did they have to wait for some religious fervor thing to happen to them, you know, on the day of Pentecost when they were filled with the Spirit and spoke in tongues and did all that kind of stuff? Uh, you know, if that had happened to me, I would have started talking immediately. I would have started telling all my friends, hey, he, he, we were right, he was right, he rose from the dead. I wouldn't have waited those 49 days. But we gotta move on, huh? Is it on? All right. Well, it's... I've been up here for a while and I've been listening, so I kind of lost my train of thought. But um, the, the apostles and the disciples were followers of Jesus, and they, you would agree with me that they'd want other people to uh, listen to their teachings and everything, right? Um, in saying that, uh, why, all right, sorry. Um, I'm bad at this, I'm sorry. Um, so, if they're gonna like write a book a couple of years later, the Bible, um, would they put in uh, negative things about Jesus or things disproving Jesus into the book if they wanted people to read it and follow Jesus? Um, that's a good question. I, I do think that they did put in a couple of things in there. Um, one of the things I mentioned about the criteria of enemy attestation a few moments ago, Another one of the criteria is the criterion of, uh, of embarrassment. And we applied that to the empty tomb with the women that uh, that would have been embarrassing to first century Christians. So that's why most critics today would say it wasn't an invention. The empty tomb tradition wasn't an invention because if it was, they wouldn't do something that was embarrassing. Um, the same thing for things like, you know, the disciples themselves are saying they didn't believe and that would seem to seem to um, discredit them as witnesses because here Jesus had told them and they just come across if they're writing the Gospels they're the ones paint, portraying themselves as a bunch of knuckleheads because Jesus had told them on a number of occasions I'm gonna rise from the dead I'm gonna rise from the dead and they're not even expecting it so um, that's a thing you've got the same kind of criteria embarrassment in terms of the claim of Jesus to be the uniquely divine Son of God in Mark 13 32 where he says he doesn't know when he's coming back again the scholars look at those things and they'll say wow well there's no way that Christians would have invented that and put it into the text so it must be an authentic saying of Jesus so um, uh, did that answer your question kind of yeah I'm, I'm sorry I think it was a it was a good one though whatever Sure. I, I appreciate your waiting, though. And if you want to talk afterwards, I'll be around. Hi. Uh, I sort of have a, a quick question for both of you. Let me first let, let you know where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm a Muslim, okay? So, so th there is basically where my questions are coming well. from. So uh, for you, Dan, I, I guess that a lot of your arguments were that uh, the text that we have, the statements that we have are contradicting one another, are coming much, much later than the uh, event they describe actually happened. However, the Quran, the Book of Muslims, is written and it is as is, as is from the day that it was written and there is, no, there is no much controversy about that. Have you taken a look there? If not, sort of to know about it just to uh, say what they say about Jesus, what they say. We have a tremendous respect for Jesus, as you probably know, just as a prophet. 
Uh, and then my question for you, Mike, is uh, as far as I know, and I might be wrong on that, but as late as the 380, there were still controversy in, for example, the Nicene Creed and the Nicene Council on uh, the nature of Jesus, where he a prophet, Arius and his followers used to believe that he was actually a prophet. And uh, even though they weren't as sizable as the other side, but the other side was basically uh, put forward, I mean, the other side being that he was son of God and so on. Uh, basically because of the emperor at that time, if I understand correctly, so can you comment on that? So. Sure. Uh, in terms of the Council of Nicaea in 325, right, they, they did debate on the nature of Jesus. Was The big question is, was is he God? And um, yes, Constantine was presiding over that. Yes, he did present some pressure and he held to the deity of Jesus. Um, so. I, you know, you could put forth the case, I agree, and, and say that just because that council decided that, that doesn't mean anything. However, later on, with Constantine's successor, um, and the next, uh, there were two more councils within the same century, 357 and 378, um, uh, I believe. Um, and those two councils upheld the decision at the Council of Nicaea even when the next emperor was against it and was threatening them with their lives to deny the, the deity of Christ, they still upheld it. But I think when it comes down to who is Jesus, is he God? Um, it, you know, even though I may respect what some of the council said, I'm gonna look at the scriptures myself. And I think that there's some really clear scriptures like John 1.1, 1, 1, Colossians 2.9, and some others which certainly paint the deity of Jesus and that it's found in the New Testament and the Apostolic Fathers. I need to respond to his question about the Quran. The scriptures that you look to were written by people. The Quran was written by people. There, there are contradictions within the Quran. We don't have an original version. There's a lot of Islamic scholarship, Islamist scholarship that shows that the formation of the Quran is under a lot of doubt. They don't know what the original one is. The surahs are, are some are authentic and some aren't. I've just been reading a book by Ibn Warak on the formation of the Quran. And it is not as solid and not as clear as you make it seem to be. I, I debated a, an Islamic scholar last January in uh, Queens, New York, and discovered that the Quran has just as many problems as the Bible does when it comes to knowing the authenticity and the reliability of it. So I disagree with your claim that the Quran is, is that. It, it has a couple of nice poetic passages, but it's not a very inspiring book to me, like the, and neither is the Bible, actually. So. I, I, I have to disagree with that. It is very inspiring, and I, I know of little scholars that say the things that you say. And indeed, the Bible in itself is, has some inspiring passages, even for everyone. Thanks. Okay, I've got a very quick question for Dan. Dan? Um, yeah. Are you happier since you gave up God? Yes, I'm much happier since I gave up God, yes. Okay, me too. Thanks for coming out tonight. All right. Closing? Yeah. Well, thanks for staying through all this. This was an ordeal. It's more, more fun for us, I think, being up here. Uh, and thank you, Mike. I really respect your openness and your willingness to debate. A lot of Christians are not willing to do that. They just want to believe by faith and not dig in deep. And um, uh, I admire that in a person like you. You're a good man. The idea that I presented tonight is that the story of the resurrection of Jesus is a legend, which means that it started as a simple idea that Jesus spiritually rose and later through the decades grew into a more exaggerated, more extraordinary, more outrageous idea in Luke and John and later in the Gospel of Peter and that. Uh, the facts that I gave tonight support that and Mike agreed that at least in the telling there is an increase in the number of extraordinary events as time passes. Uh, we disagree on many of the other facts. But let me talk about this. The idea that the story of the resurrection is a legend, it's not such a bad idea. It's a very respectful idea. It's respectful of the humanity of the early Christians. We do know that the human race possesses an immense propensity to create and believe and propagate falsehood. We all agree with that. So what makes the early Christians exempt? Weren't they just people? Did they never make mistakes? Were they so superhuman that they always resisted the temptations of exaggeration and rhetoric? Did they have perfect memories? 
Do you have a perfect memory? Given the discrepancies in their accounts, why not treat those early believers like ourselves? Not like cartoon characters, but as real human beings with normal human fears, desires, and limitations. The fact that my grandmother was hallucinating did not make me respect or love her any less. I loved my grandma, even when she was hallucinating something that I knew was false. The legend idea is also respectful of the historical method. We are not required to jettison natural regularity that makes history work. We can take the New Testament accounts as reports of what people sincerely believed to be true, not what is necessarily true. We can honor the question, do you believe everything you read? Of course you don't. The legend idea is also respectful of theology. Think about it. If Jesus bodily ascended into physical clouds, then we are presented with a spatially limited flat earth God sitting on a material throne of human size with a right and a left hand. If Jesus physically levitated into the sky, where is his body now? If the bodily resurrection is viewed as a legendary embellishment, then believers are free to view their God as a boundless spiritual being, not defined in human dimensions like the pagan gods were defined. Bible scholars conclude, on the basis of a close analysis of all the resurrection reports, we decided, and this is the Westar Institute, good scholars, critical scholars, the resurrection of Jesus was not perceived initially to depend on what happened to his body. It probably decayed, as do all corpses. The resurrection of Jesus was not an event that happened on the first Easter Sunday. It could not have been captured by a video camera. We conclude that it does not seem necessary for Christians to believe the literal veracity of any of the later appearance narratives. Finally, the legend idea that I presented tonight is respectful of the freedom to believe. If the resurrection of Jesus were proved to be a blunt fact of history, then we would have no choice. There would be no faith. You can't have the freedom to believe if you don't also have the freedom not to believe. I too would like to uh, thank Dan for the gracious, gracious manner that he has uh, displayed tonight. And I just want to uh, let him know that I appreciated this debate. This has been fun. Um, tonight, I, I, I'd like to kind of close by sharing a, a story with you uh, put forth by comedian Emmo Phillips. He talks about a guy up on a bridge and he's getting ready to jump off and kill himself. And another guy comes up on the bridge and he says, um, he wants to talk him down from it, and so he tries to get the guy in a conversation, and he says, so um, before you jump, have you got your relationship with God right? And he says, well, I'm working on that right now. And he says, well, uh, well are, you, are you Muslim? Are you Hindu, Jewish, Christian? What are you? He says, well, I'm a Christian. And he says, well, small world, me too, trying to develop a little rapport. And he says, uh, well, are you Catholic, Protestant, or Greek Orthodox? He says, well, I'm Protestant. Me too. What denomination? Baptist. Me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? Northern Baptist. Me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? Northern Conservative Baptist. Me too. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Eastern Region? Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region. Me too. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. He said Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. And I screamed, die heretic, and I pushed him over. <laughs> I, think what, I think what Philip's story does there is to, to kind of remind us that we need to stick to the things that really matter. And see the things even about the bodily resurrection and the inerrancy of scripture are things even upon which some Christians disagree on. But that's not the topics for discussion this evening. Our, our, that's, those are different debates. Our topic discussion is, did Jesus rise from the dead? Not was the na what was the nature of his resurrection body or is the Bible an inerrant or inspired? Tonight I presented five facts which are well attested. Four of them are granted by nearly every scholar out there, and five by around 75% of all scholars. And based on that, I said, in the absence of any plausible naturalistic explanations, Jesus' resurrection is the best explanation for the data. Well, Dan responded by saying, well, it's a legend. It, um, it was uh, 
it evolved from uh, belief in a spiritual resurrection to bodily resurrection. But I pointed out that, um, no, Paul did believe in a bodily resurrection. We can see it in the Creed in 1 Corinthians 15, what goes down in burial comes up in resurrection. We can see it in Romans 8, 11, where he says, just as God raised Jesus' mortal body, he'll raise yours too. Uh, in um, Philippians 3, 21, where he, our bodies are gonna be transformed to be like Christ, transformed, not eliminated. And even most critics admit, uh, who, who believe that Paul saw a vision, they'll still say that Paul believed in a bodily resurrection of Jesus. Remember the quote I gave you from Gerk Ludeman. Um, and then remember, you know, it's not this thing that they're just working toward and hoping to spread this myth. Remember John Donnelly Cross in his own guide that he quoted um, said that these experiences, Paul meant for us to understand that, that his experience and the disciples' experience, they were legitimate experiences where they saw the risen Jesus. We have to be able to account for those. And evolving legend doesn't do that. Um, besides, even if what Dan said was correct and these disciples were wanting to carry it on because they believed in the, the Jesus that they had known, Paul wasn't of that frame of mind. He was trying to get rid of Christians and it doesn't explain how he came to believe that Jesus rose and had appeared to him. Neither does it explain the appearance to James. So you have those problems as well. Um, I, I would just kind of close by saying this. I, I hope it's become clear tonight that there is good evidence for Jesus' resurrection. And even if you remain skeptical tonight, I hope that you'll at least agree with the prominent atheist philosopher, Anthony Flew, who said that even though he doesn't believe in the resurrection, the evidence merits uh, belief in it to the point where Christians are rational in believing that Jesus rose from the dead. It's not an irrational belief. Um, I would like to thank you all for attending this evening. And um, I, if you're here tonight seeking the truth, I would like to encourage you to continue on that, that road. And I would like to assure you that the risen Jesus does live. And we haven't mentioned personal experience at all, but I, I've walked with the Lord now for over 30 years, and I just experience the living reality of Jesus in my life every day as I grow closer to him. And I have uh, just a love for him, and I'm really looking forward to meeting him someday. And I wanna assure you that the same Jesus that rose from the dead loves you, and he loves Dan. And he, in fact, with Dan, he stands there like the father of the prodigal son saying, please come back. I love you and I want you to come back. And he would like all of everyone in here to know him personally and spend an eternity with him. And um, I wanna thank you all for your...